Hi, in this video we're going to talk about misrepresentation in communication of data and findings. Sometimes this is intentional, sometimes it must just be incompetence, but either way, um, the way we present our results and our data might will influence how people perceive them and what message we're sending along with them. Uh, some of the common examples of this come from the area of uh, causality. So can we infer causality from a particular study? And if we can't, how do we convey this to people? Oftentimes as humans, we want to see causal statements like if I do X, Y will happen, or if I don't do X, Y won't happen. Um, but many of the studies do not actually show causality. We've given an example of this earlier in the class when we talked about the effect of the confounding variable with eating breakfast or uh, breakfast cereal and the BMIs of young girls, for example. So we're going to give another example here. Um, here's a, a title from a Time article. Uh, this is from back, uh, tw back from 2016, and it says exercise can lower risk of some cancers by 20%. Sounds good and sounds feasible, right? Exercise is supposed to be good for you. Uh, here's an excerpt from the article. The article said people who were more active had on average a 20% lower risk of cancers of the esophagus, lung, kidney, stomach, and endometrium, and others compared with people who were less active. Now, people who were more active had on average 20% lower risk is something a little bit different than saying exercise can lower the risk. So these people are already exercising. They are among this sample of people that were studied. And in this particular study, it was a big sample. So it was an impactful study. But ultimately, it was not a randomized control study. Let's take a look at another headline about the same uh, study. Exercising drives down risk for 13 cancers, research shows. So here we have a very causal statement. You exercise and your risk goes down. So today, if I wasn't exercising up until today and I started exercising, this article makes it sound like my risk for 13 cancers are going to go down. And so here's an excerpt from the article that says, those who got the most uh, moderate to intense exercise reduced their risk of developing seven kinds of cancer by at least 20%. Reduced is a different word than it is lower, right? So one of them actually is a causal statement versus the other one is simply saying they did this and they also happen to have lower uh, rates of incidence of cancer. Here's the original study. The title of the original study uh, is Association of Leisure Time Physical Activity with Risk of 26 Types of Cancer in 1.44 Million Adults. So 1.44 million adults is a huge number for, um, you know, a population or a sample to be studied. And in fact, that's the reason why there was a lot of news coverage about this particular study. But if we actually dig into uh, the study, it says volunteers were asked about their physical activity level over the preceding year. So they weren't told you should exercise and you shouldn't exercise. They were asked about their physical activity level. It turned out that half exercised less than about 150 minutes per week and half of them exercised more. And compared to the bottom 10% of exercisers, the top 10% had lower rates of esophageal, liver, lung, endometrial, colon, and breast cancer. And researchers found no association between exercising and 13 other cancers, for example, pancreatic, ovarian, and brain. Now, this is not to say you shouldn't exercise, but at the same time, the way this particular study was covered in the news outlets, uh, like the, the two examples we gave were from Time Magazine and Los Angeles Times, it's not really what the study was showing us, right? So um, there's what the study can really say in terms of its scope of inference and then how the media uh, chooses to present that information. Um, I purposefully chose this example because um, it's an example where you might be thinking, what's the harm if somebody misunderstood this, right? What's the harm? They would exercise more? How bad can that be? And in a way, that's true, we know that exercising is good for you. So if you were to think that, hey, I'll exercise a little bit more, and maybe I'll, that'll lower my uh, 
cancer risk too, but otherwise it has other health benefits. If that's what you want to say to yourself, that's one thing. That's a human, uh, decision. that's a personal decision. But when we're communicating uh, results from findings like this, we really want to make sure that we are not overreaching the scope of inference that the study allows for us. So earlier in the class, we've talked about scope of inference in terms of both generalizability and causality. And these are things that we really want to pay attention to. Uh, the other thing I want to mention here is that just because you can't make a causal statement doesn't necessarily mean that your study is worthless. So I don't think that we need to be, you know, plastering this saying it's always correlation, not causation on and thinking about that as a guiding principle for everything. But ultimately, for every study that you are considering, and even if this is one that you are working on, you want to make sure that you're fully aware of the scope of that particular study's inference uh, based on how the data were collected and how the analysis was conducted so that ultimately you're not overreaching with your conclusions. Um, another way misrepresentation sometimes happens is uh, in the data visualization stage, which is something we use very regularly for communication uh, of results and findings. Uh, and more and more so, we're seeing media outlets use data visualizations as well. So uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about axes and scale. So let's take a look at this picture. Um, the question I want to pose here is, what's the difference between these two pictures? on the left and the right, and which presents a better way to represent these data. So uh, this is from a 2019 Washington Post article, and uh, the numbers that you can see on top of both of the bars are the same. So this was about the Bush tax cuts uh, in the United States, and the heights of these bars represent the top tax rate. So um, this is either from now is basically right prior to um, uh, 2013, and then uh, the red bar is January 2013. So in one of them, the difference seems a lot more pronounced than the other one. The numbers we're comparing are 35% and 39.6%. So in a way, um, they're not that different than each other. If we actually set the axis, uh, the minimum for the y-axis at zero. So they are showing the same two numbers, but the difference between the heights of the bars is drastic, depending on whether you're starting with 34% as the minimum um, of your y-axis versus at zero percent. So sometimes, uh, you know, not only should you be doing the right thing when you're uh, communicating results like this or uh, data like this, but you also could, by changing how you present the information, really change how people perceive the information that you're giving to them. Because when somebody sees this giant red bar compared to the much smaller gray bar in the first image, the gut reaction is going to be, oh, wow the tax, um, top tax rate is really going to shoot up versus the difference is actually only 4.6%. Now, others might say it's not only 4.6%, that 4.6% is highly important. Um, and so that's what we want to communicate. Ultimately, these two pictures are telling two different stories. And it is important that you're not deliberately trying to fool your audience into thinking one when the other is happening. Um, some chart police, if you will, will say that your y-axis or your x-axis should always start at zero. And I don't necessarily think that's true. I think there is going to be instances where that is not necessary, uh, where the data has nothing to do with the values of zero. Um, and you really don't need to worry about uh, always uh, setting your axes to start at zero. But if this is the information you're trying to compare, these percentages are what you're trying to compare, really putting them into perspective perspective in terms of where do they lay in the zero to 100% scale would be a lot more honest of our representation of these data. Here's another example. This is uh, from Fox News, which is uh, kind of notorious for its uh, bad uh, display of uh, data. So what's wrong with this picture and how would you correct it? Let's take a look. So we have the cost of gas. Uh, we have three data points that we're plotting. Uh, that's the national average for the cost of gas. Uh, I think it's like dollars per gallon. Um, and let's take a look at the x-axis. We have last year, last week, and current, and these are equally spaced. 
versus if you think about today versus last week versus last year, these are not equally spaced. So what this picture is showing us is that between last year and last week, the uh, rate the cost of gas has been going up, but then since last week it has leveled off. Well, what if we fix the x-axis? What if we actually put that on a time scale? So here, even though I marked just those three data points, I actually did give them the dates. And so the, um, the difference between current and last week should be about one, uh, one over 52 of the difference between last year and last week. So that's, you know, spanning about 52 weeks over um, the span of a year. Well, the picture is a lot different if you think about it, right? We are seeing an increase between last year and last week, and that we're seeing an even uh, kind of steeper increase between last week and current. So this is a very different picture. And this, in this case, is definitely a misrepresentation of these data. Whether you should start your axis at zero or not, as we said, is, um, you know, might depend on the situation, depending on what you're trying to communicate and the context of those data. But whether your axes, the uh, tick marks in your axes should be um, put according to scale, I think that's always the case that we want to be doing this. Because if we distort that time scale, we're telling an entirely different story. Here's another one. Uh, this is from uh, the state of Georgia uh, in the United States, and they have released this, um, I think, back in early May. Um, and since then, this visualization has been corrected, but this was the original version of the visualization. It says top five counties with the greatest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases. So these are the top five counties in Georgia with the greatest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases as of then. And it says the chart below represents the most impacted counties over the past 15 days and the number of cases over time. The table, and then there's another table. But well, let's take a look at this chart. So what does this look like? I'm seeing heights of bars going down, right? Heights of bars are going down. But when we have information like this, and we can see that there are some dates on the x-axis, my instinct is to say, Heights of bars are going down over time, but let's take a closer look at the x-axis. We start with 28th of April, then we have 27th, then we have 29th, then we have 1st of May, 30th of May, then 4th, sorry, 30th of April, 4th of May, 6th of May, then 5th of May. So the x-axis is not in order. So the heights of bars are not going down over time. They've basically been sorted to make it look like they're going down. But this is obviously a misrepresentation of the data. So in the previous image, we looked about it. We talked about a distorted scale. Now we have a completely scrambled scale, and neither of these are um, good ways or ethical ways of presenting these data. Because to if you know if you just have just a few minutes to be looking at this and you're kind of not reading the fine print, you're going to get a much different picture than what really the data is telling you. So. Um, Here's a link to a blog post by Lucy D'Agostino McGowan. Uh, she's a professor of statistics at uh, Wake University. And um, she has um, actually done a little bit, bit of a detective work around this visualization. So I think she said that she couldn't find the exact same data they were plotting, but at the time, New York Times had similar data. So she, even though she couldn't match the exact numbers per se, she got similar data uh, based off of the New York Times source, and she was able to initially create the uh, misrepresented data. So it looked something like this with the data that she got from the New York Times if you actually scramble the date. So we can kind of see the bars going down as well. Uh, I would highly recommend reading through this blog post where she goes and uh, does a few other um, Kind of uh, implementations of this and basically walks you through what would be other better other better ways of presenting these data both in a way where she's looking doing so in static visualizations but also interact or uh, dynamic visualizations like this one as well 
Um, next, let's talk a little bit about maps and areas. So this is another commentary about data visualization, but uh, we've talked so far mostly about kind of how things vary over time and what the scales of the axes tell us. Another way where it's very easy uh, to fall into a trap of misrepresenting your data is when we're talking about uh, when we're making maps and thinking about geographic areas, but if the data that you're trying to present is more about human, so where human density is not necessarily taken into consideration, or thinking about uh, the smaller area units over which you're kind of uh, summing up whatever it is that you're trying to communicate. So let's take a look at this picture. I'll give you a second to see if you recognize this map and what it shows. So this is from the 2016 uh, United States uh, presidential election, and each one of these little boundaries are uh, counties in the United States. There are over 3,000 of them. And this is from an article from the Washington Post called, uh, titled Election Maps are telling you big lies about small things, because uh, this was a very uh, kind of this election map uh, was you know shown all over the place after um, the result of the 2016 election. In fact, it's on the cover of a book uh, that says Citizens for Trump. But um, Alberto Cairo in his uh, talk called Visual Trumpery, which is one of the talks I recommended that you watch uh, this week, uh, so that's listed amongst the videos for the week, um, actually said that the really the right way to think about this would be counties for Trump as opposed to citizens for Trump, because each of these counties don't necessarily have the same number of people. So when you say citizens for Trump, it sounds like you're counting humans, but actually the coloring is based off of counties, not humans. In fact, in the talk uh, that you'll see, uh, he goes through kind of what, what the surface level uh, on the county level map indicates versus really what the share of the popular vote was. So when we think about the humans voting as opposed to the uh, surface area of the counties and they tell two very different uh, stories. So um, here's another way, you know, we could be representing this information. So um, we could be thinking about kind of the electoral vote. So um, if we just kind of color things at the state level, that's telling one uh, story versus if we actually color them um, in terms of state size adjusted by electoral votes and, it, and uh, how it contributes to the election. So um, these are basically the electoral votes is ultimately what's deciding the election, but not the geographic areas of the state. So these two things are kind of telling, again, a slightly different story in terms of um, what the, uh, the, the underlying data is showing us. Um, and one last comment I want to make about uh, representing data is about visualizing uncertainty. So, so far in the class, we've said some words about the fact that when we think about um, making predictions or making estimations, there's some uncertainty around them, though we haven't yet gotten around to quantifying this uncertainty. That's going to be uh, what we cover in the next unit in the class. But before we get there, let's think about how we might visualize uncertainty. So here's an example uh, from um, a book of Alberto Cairo's um, where uh, the data that we're seeing is from December 2014. So it says the, uh, the front page of the Spanish national newspaper El País read, Catalan public opinion swings towards no for independence, says survey. And if you know anything about kind of Spanish politics, um, that seems perhaps a little unexpected that, um, that the Catalan public opinion says no. And if we represent the data like this, we're basically seeing that the no percentage is higher than the yes percentage. And actually everything on this particular visualization is correct. Because if you actually read the caption, it says margin of error of plus or minus 2.95% at the 95% uh, confidence level. So these margins of error basically tell us about how much off the, um, 
the estimates from the survey might be. So when we say basically uh, the survey says a particular percentage, we're saying, well, it could really be within roughly three percentage points of those. In this case, the no and the yes votes uh, uh, opinions were very close to each other, right? Those two percentages. So actually, if we put a 3% margin of error around it, it is no longer necessarily true that the public opinion has really swung the other way. Um, it really, the uh, correct value, the true population proportion could really go either way. So while this particular visualization is not incorrect, it doesn't actually communicate the information as well as it could. So perhaps doing something like this would be a lot better, where we do mark the particular um, uh, findings from the survey. So that's the blue point and the red point, blue point for no, red point for yes, and then the gray for no answer. So we still present those data exactly as they were presented in the previous um, a visualization, but we put these uh, margin of error bounds around it as well. The other thing is that it is not necessarily the case that every uh, member of a society necessarily knows what the term margin of error is. So here, for example, a recommendation that Alberto Cairo makes um, in this one report that I've cited at the bottom of the um, slide is to actually explain what it means. So it would say something like the probability of the tiny difference between the no and the yes being just due to random chance is very high. So instead of just reporting the margin of error, um, we could actually make additional effort to explain what that means in layman's terms. This is not to say we shouldn't report the margin of error, but simply putting it there and saying this is a factually true visualization is not always good enough. We want to make sure that we're actually presenting the data in a way that's most accessible and so that it is, um, you know, it can be perceived exactly as it is supposed to be perceived by any member of the society. Um, if you're interested in this sort of um, kind of misrepresentation of data and um, how to do better, but also case studies about things that went wrong, uh, a couple recommendations I have for further reading. Uh, one is a book by Alberto Cairo, whose video you're going to be watching called How Charts Lie. And another one is from Carl Bergstrom and Jeff and West, uh, called Calling Bullshit. Uh, these are both very enjoyable reads and kind of, um, they really, uh, you know, they're not giant books and they're uh, kind of quick to get through and they're chock full of case studies of um, kind of miscommunication of data and findings, sometimes perhaps with malintent in mind and sometimes uh, simply due to incompetence, but either way, definitely misrepresenting the information that they're trying to communicate. And not only are they case studies uh, of examples there, which make for good stories, but more importantly, the book's going to how to do better on both of, on these areas.